go ahead and get started with our lesson. Um, Father, we are indeed grateful for this time that we can uh, gather together today. We, we just thank you for your word that you've given it to us so that we could read and, and learn from and, and study. And just pray that as we learn together, that we that we study together today, that we would uh, uh, apply your word faithfully, that it would have meaning to us, that we'd be able to um, apply this as we go forward with our week and, and forward. Father, we um, do thank you for the trips to Italy and, and for Emma for the good report there. Thank you that she's doing well. Thank you that um, Thomas and Ray had a great opportunity to visit with her and spend time with her there. Uh, Father, we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. So we are continuing our theme today with the Minor Prophets. This is our first of the Minor Prophets. We did two weeks of introduction, um, just kind of uh, some backfill. We did some... Um, we talked about some of the literary elements that you would look for a couple of weeks ago. So we're actually going to start today with um, the first of our minor prophets, Obadiah. Just a reminder, these are the primary texts or the books that we're referring to, uh, interpreting the minor prophets by uh, Robert Chisholm. I think some of you have gone ahead and bought that. Um, you know, all the guys teaching uh, have a copy of that, I believe. Uh, John Blanchard, the major points from the minor prophets. That is free on um, Kindle. If you have a Kindle Unlimited, you can download that pretty easily. Uh, if not, it's like ten dollars if you want to get that. That's a good book, also. Uh, this one is a the last one, the Prophets of Israel. This is a textbook that George found and, and got for all of us, which has been really useful as well. I doubt that you'll have as much luck finding that on the shelf somewhere, but just so you know, that's um, it, it's not real expensive, but um, anyway, those, those are the books that we are, are using, so primarily. Of course, other resources as well. All of our materials, I'm, I'm behind again. Last two weeks ago, I was very much up to date with everything. I haven't got the last lesson posted yet, but you can use a QR code to scan and go out to YouTube, to Google Documents. Google, Google Drive does not require, or, or does require, um, permission to get, so you have to have the link. Uh, YouTube, you can just search out there. They're open to anybody. They're, they're public access. But those are the URLs, uh, QR codes you can scan go directly out there. You're so high tech. This was easier than trying to give everybody the link. I, I just okay. thought, I, I can tell you, okay, go to this link, uh, explain you how to get there. And Bob, you did it last time, didn't you? I took a picture. Oh, okay. Well, he's halfway there. <laughs> now I got to take the next step. Okay. It doesn't I, even work on my phone, Bob. So you're ahead of me. So. Well, I watched it. It was pretty good. Okay, good. All right. So as we said, we're going to jump into Obadiah. Um, we're going to spend a couple of weeks on Obadiah, and Obadiah is a um, pretty short book. So spending two weeks in Obadiah may seem like a stretch. But we're probably going to spend a little bit more time diving into some of the details in Obadiah than we will on some of the other prophets, partially because it's going to give us a chance. We're going to kind of go by, verse by verse. Uh, we're not going to do that in most other prophets because this is only 21 verses long. Uh, but I want to point out some of the structure and some of the literary elements that you're going to encounter. And that will also help you as you go through and read the other prophets to look for the same themes, the same ideas as you're going forward. So that's part of why we're going to spend a little bit more time on Obadiah. So what do we know about Obadiah? Well, um, we don't know a whole lot about Obadiah. There are at least 12 other people in the Old Testament with the name Obadiah. Uh, it is a fairly common name. So um, it's unlikely that any of the other Obadiahs that are mentioned are the same Obadiah the prophet. Um, most, you know, I'll just say that scholars generally have not connected any of the other ones to the prophet Obadiah. Doesn't mean it's not, couldn't be one of them, but um, not likely. It, again, it's a very common name. Obadiah, the name, means servant of the Lord or worshiper of the Lord or worshiper of Yahweh. So, from that perspective, it is sometimes used as a title, if you want to think of it that way. Um, so somebody might refer to somebody who is a prophet as Obadiah, like Obadiah Amos, 
you know, could be a title that somebody could apply to somebody, the servant Amos. So from that perspective, it is also possible, not as commonly held, I believe, but it is possible that the book of Obadiah is just referring generically to some to some teachings or or that were not attributable to anybody even named Obadiah. It could just be servant. So that's another possibility. I don't really believe that's true. I believe this guy's name was Obadiah, but just some different thoughts about uh, who he is. The bottom line is, <laughs> we don't know. You say, who is Obadiah? We just really don't know. That, that's, that's a bit. Okay. That, that was Obadiah? That, that, that's, <laughs> yeah. See, he's wearing sunglasses, so I can't identify him. He doesn't. He doesn't. Yeah, he doesn't. He doesn't. All right, so who knows who Obadiah is? Um, but apparently it's not, it's not important, because if it were that important, God would reveal that to us. We would have that information. So let's talk a little bit about the backstory. Uh, the, the graph on the left-hand side, uh, a couple of weeks ago or sometime back, I talked about some of the resources that are available on the Google Drives. One of them is some of these posters and, and videos from the Bible Project. So this is kind of a fun depiction. Uh, I thought it kind of captured the backstory there a little bit. Uh, as you probably know, um, um, Esau and Jacob were twins, and they became Edom and Israel. They were, um, the, their rivalry was predicted in the womb. You know, it was said that there were going to be two great nations that evolved out of the twins that are in, in the womb. Uh, then we have some other uh, rivalries here. We know that Jacob talked Esau out of his birthright. Jacob tricked Isaac into blessing him instead of Esau. <clears throat> um, the as far as the birthright goes, remember that um, Esau uh, traded his birthright for what? A pot of stew. A pot of stew. What color was a stew? Do you remember? Red. Red, red stew. Keep that in mind because that word red kind of has meaning for us as we go through this. Uh, Esau or uh, Edom actually means red. So, and we'll, we'll cover we'll. Uh, talk a little bit more about that um, as we go forward. So, <clears throat> because of this backstory, Esau bore a grudge, I think. Um, he bore a grudge and he plotted to kill Jacob. And uh, his mom said, told Jacob, you know, go hide and all this sort of stuff. Um, and then, fast forward, um, as Israel was coming out of Egypt and they were wanting to possess the land of Canaan, they tried to pass through. Edom, the nation of Edom, now a nation of Edom, and Edom said, nope, you're not going to come through here. If you try to, we're going to slaughter you. So they didn't pass through Canaan. Uh, later, uh, David captured and subjugated Edom. They became part of, of Israel, part of Judah, and later um, Edom revolted against Judah, and uh, then they separated and became independent again. So there's this, this long history of tension, of family feuding between Edom and um, Israel. Just wanted to lay that background here. Because this whole book, I should preface, the whole book is uh, a prophecy against Edom, which is not um, <clears throat> completely, um, uh, well, it, it's unusual. Uh, <clears throat> there are other prophets who speak to other nations, <clears throat> but mostly the prophets are speaking to Israel or Judah. There's only, I can't remember, I think there's two others that speak to another nation. I think it's Amos, well, I can't remember. Um, there, there's two other prophets that speak to other nations. Uh, Obadiah is one of the few that do. So, um, while it's not unheard of, it is unusual. <clears throat> okay, so what is the date? I struggle with this for quite a bit, as actually so do many scholars, but um, the date is really unknown. There's two most commonly held uh, beliefs. There is no reference in the book to a king or anything else that we can put a stake in the ground and say, okay, this is the historical marker. There's the only historical marker that Obadiah gives us is in verses 10 through 14, we see there's an invasion of Jerusalem. 
So we have to go back and look and see, okay, let's see if we can find an invasion of, uh, of Jerusalem. There are actually many, the, the four most uh, common ones or most prominent ones here that we want to look at are in 926 BC, um, <clears throat> you know, Shishak, I was going to say Shake Shack of yeah. Egypt, you know, plundered the temple of the palace during the reign of Rehoboam. Now what's important here is Edom was still subject to Judah during this time frame, so bear that in mind. So in 845 BC, uh, the Philistines, the Arabs, they looted the palace during the reign of Jehoram. Uh, this is during the same time period that Edom revolted and separated from, um, from Judah. 790 BC, King uh, Jehoash of Israel invaded Judah. This is kind of an interesting story. Um, um, <clears throat> uh, Jehoash kind of tempted the king of king of uh, Israel. Said, "Hey, we should meet and have this uh, kind of duke it out." And the um, uh, no, no uh, I can't remember who's the king of, of Judah. I can't remember who it was. Anyway, A M I A C I H. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So he was one who challenged Jehoash, and Jehoash said, uh, no, we better not. And um, he kept challenging him, and finally said, okay, let's do this. So they came, and uh, Jehoash defeated Judah, and ended up uh, plundering the temple and cleaning that up, taking all the gold out of the temple. 586 BC, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, defeats and destroys Jerusalem, uh, utter destruction. We talked about that, we went through Lamentations, that was the event that we talked about there. And Judah was taken captive and taken, so, some fled to Egypt, but many were taken captive to Babylon. So of those four, there's a couple that don't really make sense for us to place it with that, with that context. So if we look at these, um, we can pretty much get rid of number one because Obadiah seems to be referring to an independent Edom when he's right. So Edom is independent. The event of number one, Edom was still subject to Judah. So that one doesn't align. <clears throat> the other one that doesn't really align is the 790 because we haven't read through the, the verses yet, but in the invasion, Edom refers, I mean, Obadiah refers to the invasion of strangers. Strangers will enter and plunder your land. Well, the northern kingdom, these are not strangers. These are their brothers. So this would not meet the qualification of strangers invading the land. So we can get rid of number three most likely. So that leaves us with number two and number four. Um, initially, I was more inclined to go with number four. Some of the other guys in our group were more inclined to go with number two. We had, and that's why we put, if if the 845 date is correct, that puts Obadiah squarely as the first or the earliest of the writing mm -hmm. prophets. So that would make sense that we start our series with Obadiah for going in chronological order. Well, let's look at some of the strengths and weaknesses here, or, or the arguments, not strengths and weaknesses. <clears throat> if you're arguing for the 845 date, um, you would argue that Obadiah does not specifically indicate total destruction, um, meaning the burning of the, burning of the temple and the palace that marks the Babylonian invasion. Obadiah doesn't seem to be specific or, or indicate that degree of destruction. So depending on how you read the text. Um, we also see in verse 11 that after the invasion, they were casting lots. Well, if you were Nebuchadnezzar and coming in utterly destroying the city, and you're also a single player, are you going to be casting lots for what's left over? Nothing. Probably not. There's nothing left over after Nebuchadnezzar. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the Philistines and the Arabs coming in and attacking together, it makes more sense in verse 11 that they might cast lots for whatever is remaining and then they can take, uh, take the spoils of war, the spoils of victory. So um, also, all the, every other prophet who speaks of the 586 invasion names Babylon specifically. So without exception, 
So why would Obadiah <clears throat> break trend and not mention uh, Babylon specifically? You know, it doesn't mean that he couldn't, but it's inconsistent with the other prophets. <clears throat> and the other thing that to me became the most compelling argument is in verse 19, Obadiah refers to Ephraim. Well, Ephraim is a reference to the northern kingdom. And <clears throat> he references it as if it is still existing. Well, if this is the Babylonian invasion, if, it's, if it's the 586, then the northern kingdom is already gone. Mm -hmm. So this, to me, that last point, bullet point, to me, is the most compelling argument. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that he still refers to Ephraim. Everything else is, yeah, you can interpret it one way or another, but I think that, to me, makes it fairly clear. However, <laughs> look at the arguments for 586. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the looting of 845, the Babylonian invasion, is not un on par <clears throat> with the disaster language in Obadiah. So on one hand, you see on the left-hand side, it says, well, he doesn't specifically indicate total destruction. However, the language does indicate a pretty devastating attack. Probably, you know, it's it feels like it's um, more destructive than just a looting of the temple. So um, <clears throat> so we really can't tell from either of those first bullet points. Neither one is conclusive. Edom is not <clears throat> specifically mentioned as participating in the 845 invasion. So if you go back and look at the historical records, uh, the other references, Edom is not directly mentioned in those attacks. Um, so again, um, they would say that that's, that's an indication that it's not um, not referring to uh, the 845, uh, but Edom is mentioned in the 586 invasion. If you go to Psalm 137, mm -hmm. Lamentations, Ezekiel, there's several references to that attack that Edom is specifically uh, talked about. Also, not to be discounted, just the order of the canon. Mm -hmm. Where did the early church leaders place the book of Obadiah, and they place it later, midway through the Minor Prophets, which would indicate a later date. Mm -hmm. All things considered, I, I tend to lean now more toward 845, but either one is, you know, you can argue either one. There's another argument there, yeah. I mean, it says don't stand on the fork of the road to cut down their fugitives. <coughs> you gotta figure if they're being attacked from the Philistines and from the Arabs, they're getting squeezed, where are people gonna go? You know, probably straight down to Eden or through there. <clears throat> so, so standing in the fork and cutting down. Um, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. The, that reference, though, I think is talking about um, as Judah is fleeing, they are ambushing those who are fleeing. They're not. They're not actually. They can say, "Well, we're not actually yeah. participating in the invasion," yeah. but as they're fleeing out, they're standing there. And they're going to kind of put an ambush them as they as they escape. So that's something that Obadiah accuses them of. So, okay, so uh, that's enough about the dates. Um, so, any questions or anything about the background there? Thanks for putting all that thought together. That's pretty in depth. Oh. Uh, I just read a couple of books. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're a yeah. genius. Yeah. No. <laughs> right. um, okay. I actually read several, and and the more I've read, um, our 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 primary text Chisholm actually follows the 586. He he thinks it's the Babylonian invasion, and that's probably what influenced me early on because I was starting with that text, and that was the first you read, so. You have that bias. The first thing you read is usually the thing you, you pick up on. But and he was wrong. And well, you know, <laughs> um, I I I found that um, the preponderance of scholars that I read anyway follow the 845 thing. So, and and I, I believe most of the guys like Thomas and George. I don't know what you guys what your thoughts are, but uh, I know that Tyler when he put that, put together his timeline. He placed um, um, Obadiah early in the process instead of later. So, I think for me, one of the things is that it's thematically or <clears throat> it's 
it's sort of like Mark's gospel compared to the other three. It's mm -hmm. the shortest, but it contains all of the elements <clears throat> that the yeah. others expand on. So I think Obadiah is thematically an early book. Otherwise, there's no value to it. Right. Yeah, it, it really is. Uh, it does set the stage for a lot of things. And if you look at uh, Jeremiah 49, I believe, as you see a lot of the common themes. Obadiah, Jeremiah 49 is almost, uh, I want to say a restatement, but there's a lot of the common elements um, that you'll find between Obadiah and Jeremiah 49. So then you have to think, okay, which one came first? Was um, and, and and based on the structure and a lot of the things that we read, um, most scholars believe that Jeremiah picked it up from Obadiah instead of the other way around. <clears throat> so, eight yeah. forty. Eight forty. There you go. Well, they're off by five years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Charles Ryrie. That's 840 or 586. Yeah. So. yeah. That's what he said. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> right there. Well, okay. Ryrie has spoken. We're done. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the structure. Um, another thing I told you that was out there on our uh, web website or Google Docs. I will pass this around. I find these to be really, uh, really handy. Just a quick overview. These are the Charles Swindoll's um, outlines of. He has one of these for every book in the Bible, and <clears throat> I don't always follow this exactly, but it helps me to structure and see where I am. I'm a visual person. I also like to outline things in my mind. It helps me to place things in order and understand what's happening here. Um, so this is very useful. I didn't make a copy of this to hand out because you guys can, can find it in Google Docs on the back. Um, I also put uh, all of his notes that he talked about. This is kind of a summary of the notes. So there's one of these for all the prophets. I'll pass that around. And you'll see he divides the book into three broad sections, which I agree with. Um, there, the one thing that I would um, make a distinction on, well, let me just, there's three three sections here, the announcement of judgment in verses 1 through 9. There's <clears throat> the accusations or the reasons for the judgment in verses 10 through 14. And then verses 15 through 21, I've called this anticipation of the day of the Lord. Now, um, the first two, if you, when you get to verse 15, it's sort of like a um, hinge or a connecting verse between the two sections. Because up through verse 14, it's clearly talking to and addressing Edom. But when we get to verse 15, he switches and he talks to all nations. So there is a pivot there, and it makes it a, um, an interesting shift. Um, you're going from Edom to all nations in verse 15. So <clears throat> if, you, if you want to, you can kind of divide it. Two, two sections, if you want to look at it that way, the message to Edom, then the message to all nations. That's another way you can structure this. But I went ahead and went with um, three segments here. So let's start with the announcement of judgment. This section is a decree from the Lord followed by a judgment speech. Two weeks ago we talked about what are the different elements, the different types of language that we see in the prophets. Judgment speech is one of those things. Do you guys remember what the elements of a judgment speech are? A judgment speech contains the accusation and the judgment, the pronouncement of the judgment, and then sometimes it'll include a result or something similar, you know, what, what happened because of this. <clears throat> so we'll look at the judgment speech, we'll look at the structure, how it follows the structure of a judgment speech, and then we go into an expansion, kind of a you know, let's give you a little more details, a backstory on what's going on in the, for the judgment. Uh, and then there's a conclusion in verses 8 and 9. So that's um, the announcement or the first section of the book. Um, <clears throat> so in the very first one, let's just go ahead and, and read through <clears throat> verses 1 through 9. And <clears throat> actually, as we're doing this, let me skip ahead 
a couple of slides here. Uh, so, <clears throat> yes, yeah, so organizing this was a little bit of a challenge. I wasn't sure where to put this because um, this takes us a little bit deeper in. But um, let's go ahead and read verses one through nine. And what I want you to look for as we're reading verses one through nine, Edom. The, 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 main, the main accusation against Edom is its pride or arrogance. So what are the sources of the pride and arrogance? What are they proud of as we read through these, uh, these verses? And I'll go ahead and give you a hint, things to look for. Look for groupings in verses 3 through 4. There's a groupings in verses 5 and 6. 7 is another grouping, and verse 8 is another grouping. So there's kind of four categories, if you will, of things that they are proud of. Okay, so let's start. Uh, the vision of Obadiah. Thus says the Lord concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord, and an envoy has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise, and let us go against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You are greatly despised. <clears throat> the arrogance of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rock and the loftiness of your dwelling place, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the earth? Though you build high like an eagle, though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. If these come to you, if, uh, if these come to you, if robbers by night, oh, how will you be ruined? Would they not steal only until they had enough? If great gatherers came to you, would they not leave some gleanings? Oh, how Esau has been will be ransacked and his treasures searched out. All the men allied with you will send you forth to the border, and the men of and the men at peace with you will deceive you and overpower you. They will eat your bread, <clears throat> will set ambush for you. There is no understanding in him. Will I not in that day, declares the Lord, destroy wise men from Edom and understanding from the mountain of Esau? Then your mighty men will be dismayed, O Tenon, in order that everyone may be cut off from the mountain of Esau by slaughter. So you guys tell me, what do you see? Uh, let's look at verses 3 through 4. What, what are the sources of pride there? Where they live. Okay. So where they live and um just that impenetrable fortress yeah actually he took my my marker i, I told him i didn't need a marker but now i kind of wish i had one um okay <laughs> so so the first one is uh, i would call it geography where they live you know they live high and high in the mountains they live uh, they live so high up it's like they're they're living among the eagles they're living among the stars they can touch the stars and they look down on everybody else. You cannot access them. You cannot attack them. They feel safe and secure in their environment. Um, has anybody here been to Petra? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. That is where we're talking about. This is, that is the home of the Edomites. Mm -hmm. So if you think about that area, um, you know, they felt very secure in the cliffs, in the, in, in the, in hiding out in the cliffs. They felt like nobody could attack us here. So not only uh, physically speaking, but this is metaphorically speaking also, they also felt superior to other people. So they felt high in their um, in, in other aspects as well. They were haughty and, and arrogant. So um, so the, the height of, uh, of, of where they are is both a physical and a metaphorical pronouncement. Basically, they were rock stars. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. Basically. Basically. All right. So verses 5 and 6, what do we see there? This seems a, maybe a little bit more ambiguous, but what do we see? Okay, a bunch of stuff. Okay, so geography, economy is the next one. 
So they're very proud of their wealth, what their, what their economy has done for them. They've been able to accumulate things. They have treasures. They have a lot of stuff. Yeah, so they're, they're very wealthy, apparently. And well hidden. And well hidden, exactly. Yeah, they've hidden everything, so. Okay, so, uh, and, and we'll, we'll come back and talk a little more detail about some of these things. But what do we see in verse seven? Diplomatically, they think they're secure. Diplomacy, so geography, economy, diplomacy is the third one. Yeah, they have, they're well connected with the surrounding um, communities, surrounding countries. They've, they've created um, alliances with all these other countries, which are going to come back and bite them in the butt, basically. Um, so they have a false sense of security. It's a false sense of security, exactly right. So they're proud of their, um, their diplomacy. And then we get down to verse eight. And again, this one might be a little bit obscure also, but what do we see in verse eight? And maybe even verse nine, you can get, stick with them to verse nine. They think they're wise? Or? They think they're wise. Yeah, they're proud of their philosophy is the fourth one. So geography, economy, diplomacy, and philosophy. They, uh, they think they're smarter than everybody else. You know, they're, they have wise men. So, so these are, are the areas that uh, Obadiah is addressing. Those are the four sources of their pride or sources of their arrogance. <clears throat> so as we go through, and you'll, the, I want to go ahead and cover those because uh, as we go through each section, it's important to keep that perspective in mind. So we see the very first um, verse. It, it says... Um, the vision of Obadiah, thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. So, thus says the Lord God. What do, um, what do some of the other translations say? Does anybody have sovereign Lord or sovereign God? So, the Lord God? Lord God. Lord, 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 Lord God. Okay. Um, <clears throat> it's actually sovereign Lord that is the right, um, the right words from Hebrew. It's Adonai and Yahweh are the two words. And it's not a real common pairing of words uh, of these two titles, but um, sovereign stresses his rule over all the nations. What is he pronouncing in um, verse 1? What is, what is God doing? He made a pronouncement. Yeah. And well, it's like he's saying, I'm sovereign over you, even though you have all this stuff. Okay. And that's basically what he's saying. All right. He's sovereign over them. Don't but make all, them small also, among the nations. Pardon? Don't make them small among the nations. Okay. He is. You're going to um, verse 2. But what's, what's happening in verse 1? Who is the envoy? <laughs> what's the envoy doing? Okay, but the envoy is going to do what? He's going to gather the nations against Edom. He's going to gather the nations against Edom, right? So he's being sent by Yahweh. So again, Yahweh is sovereign over all the all these nations that Edom thinks are allied with them, that they're their friends, that they've worked with, they they've got on plunder parties together, all this kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> They, they're they going to turn their backs. Pardon? Some plunder parties, that sounds fun. Yeah. Sounds like a slumber party. That's yeah, yeah. Party. <laughs> so, so they have um, <clears throat> they, they've built these great relationships with all the surrounding nations, and God is going to turn them against Edom to destroy Edom. And this is the warning that he sends out here. So <clears throat> Yahweh then stresses what? When you hear the word Yahweh, if you're an Israelite, what does that word mean to you? What does that evoke to you? The one God, basically. One God, also covenant. covenant. I've got a covenant with this guy. So what is the covenant that Israel has with God? They're his people. His people, and they... they right. So, um, so... We start off, there's a lot of stuff packed in this first first verse. We have the Lord God. We have 
the God who is sovereign over all the nations, and he's going to take all of these nations that are allied with uh, Edom, and he's going to turn them and send them in to destroy Edom. Why? Because of his covenant relationship with Israel, they will take the land. They will own the land. You know, that's, that's his covenant. So we see an envoy was sent to uh, unite the nations against Edom. <clears throat> so then we get into verses 2 uh, two through 4. Let's go down to this next slide here. Um, <clears throat> so if you look at the structure, this is the, the actual judgment speech. And you're already talking about uh, he's going to make them small. Okay. So we start with, behold. That's one of the markers that we talked about that introduces a, a, a judgment speech. You know, we talked about other words, alas, oh, things like that. When you see those kind of words, <clears throat> those will often be the markings of the beginning of this speech. We said that the prophets, the minor prophets, were really a series of speeches that they delivered to the people. They weren't necessarily in chronological order. They were just gathered um, writings here. <clears throat> but we see, behold, this marks the beginning of a speech. And then we have an inclusio. An inclusio is where the theme at the beginning matches the theme at the end. They mm -hmm. connect somehow. So, in <clears throat> uh, here we see this inclusio in verse 2. He's going to make you small. And then in verse 4, I'm going to bring you down. You know, kind of the same theme. You know, they, are, they consider themselves to be um, large and great. He says, I'm going to make you small. They, they are trusting in their heights and where they live. I'm going to bring you down. So that's the inclusio that we we see here. And then at the end, declares the Lord is a very common marker of this is the end of that speech. So, so we see verses 2 through 4. So what is the accusation that you see in verses 2 through 4? So if this is a judgment speech. There's got to be an accusation, and there's got to be a judgment, and there may be a result. So, so what is the accusation? Arrogance. Verse 3, your, the arrogance of your heart has deceived you. So the arrogance of your heart has deceived you. How did it deceive them? We'll talk more. Well, um, we've already talked a little bit about that, but they, they trust in their alliances. They trust in their loftiness. They trust in all these things that have really no ability to protect them ultimately. So their arrogance. It's, it's interesting that he goes, you are greatly despised. Okay. He's talking about those nations. Yeah. Not just not just despised by the Lord. You're despised by these nations. You've been so, so, so hold, hold looking that, down. Yeah, so hold that thought. So so we have an accusation about their arrogance. So now what is the judgment? What does he tell them is gonna happen? Stacy, so you already mentioned one. Well, the, he's gonna yeah. make them small and yeah. yeah. I'm gonna cut you down. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna make you small. So the, that's the judgment. You're, you're going to get your comeuppance here. And what's the result is what, what Scott was just saying. Um, the result or the connection here, you are greatly despised by the nations and also by God. So I, I think you're right. The thing that says you are despised, I think it's referring not only to God, but also among the nations you are despised. It's going to make them into Steve Martin. <clears throat> what? It's going to make them into Steve Martin. You're going to get some first. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Edom, Edom has dared step into the realm of God, saying, "Look at what I've done," mm -hmm. and God is saying, "Let me show you what I am going to do in response." That's right. You, you, you claim to have done such great things. I'm going to make them nothing. Yeah. And, and He says that a couple times. He says, "I will," yeah. and He asks the question, "Who will?" Right. Yeah. And he says, "I will." That whole attitude really was early. If you look back in Genesis and you see all the, the things that Esau's line did, music and working in metals, all these things that are listed there. So that kind of the arrogance of pride started really yeah. way back. Right. And who was it? Was it, was it Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel? Right? Who, who Daniel warned him about not claiming his, his own hand at work. 
And one day he looks, he goes, look at what I have built. Mm -hmm. And instantly, God turned him into a mindless beast. Mm -hmm. He said, I warned you. Yeah. Never pick up. Mm -hmm. yeah, we, we see that um, <clears throat> repeatedly throughout scripture. Even um, uh, we were recently talking about Jericho. So if you look at the way the walls of Jericho were built, I, I never known this, but I read an article where the, the walls were built at kind of an angle. So so they were the interior was angled in so to push that thing over, you know, you know, if you're trying to push a triangle over, I mean it just doesn't work very well. But we see that the walls of Jericho, what did they do? They built in. Just completely put and everything we believe about our own engineering, our own ingenuity, you know, just, yeah, yeah, just went out the door. So, yeah, never, never underestimate God's power and his authority. And that's, and that is a lot of what we see in, in verse one, is it's really establishing God is in control. And the, the idea of Yahweh, the use of that, is it's a reminder of God remembers his covenant with his people. So, there's a covenant relationship, and also God is in control. In charge here. <clears throat> uh, so we talked about what are the sources of Edom's pride. Um, so the um, in in verses five through seven, this is an expansion. So we see the actual judgment speech proper in verses two through four, and then the verses five through seven are kind of an interesting um, structure here. It's uh, a couple of you know, if if statements uh, or if, or if, if conditional clauses here, you know, if this, if that, and then there's a statement and a rhetorical question in verse five a, and then the same structure repeats itself. There is an if conditional clause, but then we flip it around. There's a question and then a statement uh, in verses five uh, b through six. So let's look at that. What are the conditional clauses in five? If robbers come to you, if thieves come to you, uh, if robbers by night. So those are the two conditional. So if these things happen, and then there's a statement that says, oh, how you will be ruined. And then a rhetorical question is, would they not steal only until they had enough? So what does all that mean? That's kind of a weird, you know, what's, what's he trying to say here? They're taking it all. <clears throat> be nothing. Okay, yeah, there's nothing left, but why is why is he making that point? Because who does that? Who does that? Exactly. The, <clears throat> traditionally, uh, if thieves come, they're not going to take everything. They're going to leave something, you know, because first of all, there's a limitation, you know, there's time. You know, they're, they're going to come and take something, they're going to leave. They're going to, they're going to leave some things behind. Because they're only going to take what they can sell. What <clears throat> right, yeah. But here, they're taking everything. Nothing will be left. So we look at the same thing in, um, in verse um, 5b. If gatherers come to you, grape gatherers come to you, so what do we know about harvesting grapes? We're doing a harvest. Um, I think we talked about this. I think it was Doug Greenwald who told some of this um, tradition. When when the harvest is gathered, they leave gleanings in the corners of the field. But why do they do that? For the, for the poor. For the, widows. for the widows of the poor, so they can come and gather. So that's tradition. So even the grape grape gatherers are not going to strip bare the land. They are going to leave something behind traditionally. But what he's saying here is that if great gatherers come to you, would they not leave some gleanings? Um, uh, but then he says, oh, how Esau will be ransacked. And I think it was I think Bob said a minute ago, not only didn't have all this treasure, but their treasure was well hidden. Because it's hidden. They had, well, you see the bank. And, you know, it's, um, you know, they, they, um, have everything hidden in the clefts of the rocks, and, and you got to be very um, creative to find it. Well, they searched it out and they found it, and they took everything. So they were stripped bare. 
a side note that I read that was, I thought was really interesting. Uh, <coughs> Eden, Eden was ultimately destroyed, as you know. Um, probably around 100 AD is what I've read, is where they finally kind of disappeared and never heard from again. When was the city of Petra, the place that you visit, when was that discovered or rediscovered? Any guesses? It was in the 1800s, right? 1800s. Yeah. So for 1,700 years, Petra, I mean, all of these, they were unknown to civilization. So that's how obscure, how high up in the mountains, how uh, un, uh, untainable these places were. So think about that. I mean, uh, the Edomites felt very secure because you're not just passing by this and seeing it on your way to the grocery store. You know, you had to be intentional about getting there. So Edom felt very secure. And it took 1,700 years after they fled for other people to discover it. That's just how obscure it, it was. To discover what God had just wiped out. Yeah. He said, even the people who plunder and pillage you are going to leave some some scraps behind. He says, but I'm not. That's right. There's not going to be any. Well, it, it's in, in uh, <coughs> 70 AD when the when the temple was destroyed. It says, not even one stone is going to be left right. on top of another. That is how you know, utter, utter the destruction is going to be. Right. So yeah, just a couple minutes here left here. So um, so let's look at the conclusion of verses um, um, eight and nine. <clears throat> so when we conclude this section in verses eight and nine, there are thematic elements here that tie back to the previous verses. So we see. Uh, let's just read verses eight and nine here. We see. Um, uh, Will I not on that day declares the Lord destroy wise men from Edom? and understanding from the mountain of Esau. Then your mighty men will be dismayed of Tenon in order that everyone may be cut off from the mountain of Esau by slaughter. So a couple of thematic uh, tie-ins here. The Lord intervenes in verse 8. We say, uh, will I not on that day destroy the wise men of Edom? So there's an intervention there. We also see in verses 2a and verses 4 that God is also intervening here. So there's that tie-in. The destructive results in verse 9, um, in order that uh, everyone may be cut off from the mountain of Esau by slaughter, they will be destroyed. That also ties back to verse 2b. The use of style, the rhetorical questions, um, you know, is reflected or, or um, ties us back to verses 5 and 6. And the idea of understanding um, in uh, verse, so verse eight. It says, uh, "In understanding from the mountain, so I will destroy the wise men from Edom and understanding from the mountain of Esau." What they thought was really wisdom that he's going to wipe that out. He's going to destroy their understanding. That ties back to uh, the previous verses as well. So <clears throat> then, everyone cut off. That idea will come back up again in the next section of the book. Um, so we see cut off a couple of times in this book. There's nothing left, you know, as, as you pointed out. The whole, they're, they're cut off from the mountain, there's nothing left. It's interesting too, that he kind of, the Lord says he's gonna destroy the brains and the brawn is gonna be dismayed. So it's brains and brawn, both yeah. from Edom that are, yeah. you know. That's interesting. So, um, so I think I'll stop there because it is 9.45. Um, I, I was thinking I'd get through verse 14, but we'll pick that up next week. Um, <clears throat> so if you want to continue reading, uh, just you know, consider that the outline that I gave you. Um, verses 10 through 14 contains the accusation specifically. So what's interesting is we have a judgment speech within a judgment speech in this book. So... Uh, verses 2 through 4 is the judgment speech proper. We saw the structure there. We saw behold. It ends with declares the Lord. We see the inclusio. That's a classic judgment speech. But even if you look at the 
the structure of the book uh, through verses four, through verse 14, we have the first nine verses are a um, judgment, and then verses uh, 10 through 14 are again the accusations on a broader scale. So we have kind of a, a structure within a structure, if you want to think of it that way. So, um, <clears throat> Yeah, I think it's probably best to stop there uh, because there's some things I don't think we have time to get into. So, so read, read the rest of the, um, the book, all 21 verses. If you have a chance this week, it shouldn't take you too long. And uh, then we'll pick up next week. All right. Yeah, memorize it. So, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Just, just memorize it. Yeah. We'll put Thomas to the test. Uh, Scott, Scott, would you pray for us as we leave? Sure. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that we know that evil will eventually be destroyed even in our day. And uh, we ask that we would be wise and to uh, see your workings as you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That's one of the applications, by the way, is, is that we can think about is, what's the hope for us? What do we get out of this book? And yeah. we know that there will be those who circle around us to attack us, but, you know, if we are faithful to God. I have a theory. Oh. Uh, this is what Tolkien was thinking about when he wrote The Hobbit. You get it? No. Okay, so they were up we're, in the mountains. We're, we're, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's been, it's been 40 treasure. years since I've read The Hobbit. I'm in the mountains. Long dead. It's <laughs> long, we took it because they got oh, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Go through more to it. Right there, you go. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so that you make a big picture of that. Yeah.